sort of slight nervous. Great, great. great. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. So we're going to get started. I think we'll, we'll see a few people um, join the webinar as, uh, as we get things going here, but I, I, I realize everyone's time is, is valuable to them. So um, we'll, we'll kick this thing off. And um, what I want you to notice uh, sort of as you're signing in here is there's a couple of windows in the top right-hand corner of your screen. There's a participant window, there's a chat window, and there's a Q&A window. And we'd, we'd like for you to use the chat window or the Q&A window, whichever is easier for you, to ask any questions that you have of our uh, featured presenter, April Ladinsky. Um, if you also have technical issues, you can write to uh, Macmillan Education. Uh, my colleague uh, and marketing assistant, Jillian Daniels, uh, and I will be able to help you, uh, hopefully, with those questions. And we will also be recording the webinar. So what we'll do uh, post-webinar is sort of re-release the recording out through our Macmillan community, and we'll tell you a little bit more about that later on the call. So uh, welcome to our Wacktivism webinar. <laughs> I'm delighted to have you all join us. Uh, my name, as I said, is Joy Fisher-Williams, and I'm the marketing manager at Bedford St. Martin's Macmillan. I'm responsible for the English list, along with a few other colleagues, including Jillian, who I just mentioned. I'm also joined by Senior Executive Editor Steve Scipioni. And Steve, I believe, is going to introduce April in just a moment. I want to mention one more thing, which is that um, Stuart Green, who is April's co-author, is also on the call. So welcome, Stuart. Uh, I think we'll probably do some Q&A a little bit later where you can chime in, certainly. Um, and uh, without further ado, Steve, I hand it to you for the introduction. Well, thank you, Joy. Our speaker, April Ladinsky, is Associate Professor of Women's and Gender Studies at Indiana University South Bend, where she directs the Women and Gender Studies program. Her PhD is from Rutgers University and is in Literatures and English. She's published, taught, and spoken at many conferences on the topics of writing pedagogy, women's autobiography, creative nonfiction, and popular culture. A contributor to or author of several textbooks on writing, she served as the acting director of the University Writing Program at Notre Dame and has won several awards for her teaching and research, including the 2015 Indiana University South Bend Distinguished Teaching Award. April's been a longtime public radio commentator on WVPE and was awarded a regional Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Writing for her contributions to the Michiana Chronicles on that radio station. Thank you all for tuning in to hear what April has to say about Wacktivism, our teaching cultural critique, and an academic writing course. Over to you, April. All right, thank you. And it is just awfully fun to say the word Wacktivism. So, <laughs> um, so thank you very much, all of you, for uh, joining in, and to Jillian and Joy and Steve for helping to set this up. Uh, and Stuart, I'm really glad you can be part of this. So. Um, uh, so I'll be talking today and hopefully crowdsourcing with all of you ideas for using cultural text to inject relevance into your composition classes uh, and hopefully some fun as well. I know this time of year is really, we're all deep in the trenches. <laughs> and while I teach women's and gender studies now, I really, uh, yeah, I started as a composition instructor and I really teach composition in all of my classes. So the techniques that we'll be talking about today and the strategies are relevant beyond composition classes as well, for sure. Um, so the aim of this hour will be to add to your pedagogical tool chest and to give you some additional resources for helping students ask good questions, make connections, apply theories to examples, and consider the implications of text that you're already using in your classes. So hopefully just adding to what you already do. Ultimately, we'll be talking about empowering students. That's what this is about, and getting them to be engaged enough by the critical process to move ideas beyond your classroom and hopefully beyond your campus. That is basically what we're all interested in doing is a revolution. So, um, so here's the structure of our time together. And just so you know, there's about 18 slides, um, and we'll be pausing uh, after each one of these sections here for some feedback, uh, for ideas, uh, sharing ideas, asking questions and then hopefully leaving plenty of time at the end for sharing best practices. So part one is going to be uh, driven by this question, what makes a writing across the curriculum classroom a promising place to teach cultural critique? Uh, part two will be a little bit about high impact practices, uh, HIPs, ideas for in-class cultural uh, critique and activities. And then part three will move to writing assignments that build on, uh, on all of those. So here we go, here's part one. 
So what makes the WAC classroom uh, a promising place to teach cultural critique? So, uh, you know, since we come out of rhetoric, we know we start with definitions. So when we talk about writing across the curriculum, we're talking about writing not just as a product, of course, but as a mode of thinking and learning. So that's a definition I'm sure you all know that really focuses on writing as a process. So writing across the curriculum also refers to disciplinary discourse communities, particular audiences, needs, expectations. So there's also that valence of writing across the curriculum, a focus on rhetoric. And I know some of you are probably in programs that really um, focus on writing in the disciplines, and that's something that increasingly uh, we need to offer our students. Uh, that's a rhetorical kind of framework. So we'll be thinking of both of those as we talk about cultural critique and use of cultural critique in the, in the classroom, the WAC classroom. So let's move then to a definition of what we mean by cultural critique. Um, so briefly, you know, this is, I guess, a way of talking about the ways that we could invite students to see all aspects of culture as potentially, at least, ideologically rich texts. Uh, texts that carry political and economic significance, texts that are worthy of analyzing. Comp classrooms can be a place to foster rigorous question asking, challenging of cultural norms, uh, all while acknowledging that culture itself, of course, is varied, complex, contradictory, ever shifting. Uh, that's a good takeaway for our students alone. So I'll be talking today about using advertising, film trailers, social media artifacts, hashtag campaigns, campus publicity artifacts. Um, that's just the start of a list, and I'm sure that you'll have ideas to share about cultural texts that have been really effective in your classroom as well. So again, I'm hoping that by the end of the hour, uh, folks will chime in the chat room and share some of your own best practices, um, texts that are sort of fail-safe for teaching particular things. So why teach cultural critique at all? Um, and I guess we have to kind of face the fact that there are detractors here. Um, so are there any downsides to doing this? So I guess naysayers could say, well, you're just pandering to students. You're giving them what they like, what they want, which is more pop culture. Um, but I'd actually argue that it's the opposite. That you'll, uh, if you draw on these, draw these cultural texts into your classroom, you're actually requiring them to bring your course's ideas and skills into other aspects of their lives, which is, of course, our hope that they will leave our classrooms and continue doing all the same kind of critical work uh, that we've been fostering. So in your class, you're teaching students to engage with challenging ideas, to craft responses, to think about those responses as part of a larger and ongoing conversation. Yours might actually be the only class where students learn the vocabulary and tactics of close reading, of meaning making, and argument crafting. So they might be doing that in other courses, but the composition classroom is the place where we talk about those tools, where we kind of, you know, uh, show the underside of, um, of, the, of the polished surface and help people think at a meta level what they're doing and why. So with that in mind, your class is probably the best place to give students a chance to test out these ideas in new contexts, to ask them to see many kinds of public texts as worthy of close analysis, and to see that meaning is made everywhere, and that meaning could call for responses as consumers, active citizens, um, however you might divine, uh, define activism or whacktivism, it could look like a lot of different things. So on the screen here, you'll see um, uh, an image from our book, uh, the, From Inquiry to Academic Writing, that Stuart and I have put together in its third edition here. And this is drawn from a chapter on sustainability, a collection of readings uh, in which we have pretty challenging scholarly texts and students read about, you know, the claims of uh, environmentally friendly marketing. Um, and then they can try it out with this, um, this interactive game. It's called Name That Sin. This is just available to the public. Um, uh, if you, YouTube, or if you uh, Google it, you'll see. Uh, but this game then uh, teaches students to look for clues about greenwashing and advertising that they can um, consider through the frameworks of the scholarly arguments that we have been reading, uh, the more challenging texts that we've been reading together. Um, so we also use as one of the cultural texts that students, uh, we use this rather as, the, as one of the cultural texts, then this game becomes yet one, another part of the conversation. So this is just one, you know, small example of the kinds of things that we'll be looking at in this hour. And I'll be offering more examples. And again, I hope, um, I hope you will offer some more examples as well. 
Okay, so why teach us in a writing classroom then? Why teach writing students cultural critique? And I would say that just as in any good classroom, what we're doing is offering students transferable skills, both for success in all of their other courses at the university, uh, but also for a lifetime of critical thinking. And if you are uh, following the political conversation right now, you know exactly how much <laughs> We need these skills in the U.S. I won't say any more, but um, so um, so these, this, this approach can adapt to any course. Uh, and I'll talk just a little bit on uh, this slide here about uh, ways of using it to focus on skills and using cultural text to focus on content. Um, so. Um, if we focus on skills here, uh, if you invite students, for example, to consider an advertisement, that's an opportunity for them to practice rhetorically analyzing context or situation, just like they might do with any other text. Strategies of visual, um, uh, visual persuasion, which you may or may not want to do in your course, but certainly many of our courses are building on that. Um, you can talk about linguistic emphasis, framing, interesting uses of juxtaposition, uh, all of these rhetorical strategies that likely you're inviting students to think about in the text that they're reading, that you're inviting them to think about as they craft their own responses, uh, their own essays. You can talk about persuasion based on ethos, pathos, logos. So all those Aristotelian classics that, of course, are very useful for thinking about all aspects of, uh, of textuality. Um, so these are skills likely that you're already discussing in your class. So if we think about content now, um, using cultural text, adding these to your classroom uh, can add to a composition class without a particular theme. Uh, some of us are, you know, we're sort of moving from kind of big ideas to big ideas, or this works really well um, to add a kind of superstructure or richness to courses that have themes or sub-themes. So just as an example, many of us work with media culture and advertising culture, um, maybe framed by readings like Naomi Klein's No Logo or Sherry Turkle's chapter on Growing Up Tethered, that's from Alone Together. We have a slice of that in our book. Or maybe Jean Kilborn on Gender and Advertising. There's a lot of those kinds of texts in comp readers. Um, so that's an obvious way to think about advertising and other kinds of media examples. Um, but of course, this could adapt to a themed course that's not at all focused on media and advertising. So I think about uh, comp courses that might have a topic of sustainability or environmental studies, for example. So that greenwashing text and thinking about greenwashed ads is a good example of that. Um, many of our courses take up sociological themes. That's also really good to use. Um, uh, to use these cultural texts for uh, psychology, business, education, <coughs> pardon me, any of those kinds of themes might be enhanced by cultural examples. Okay. So here's a, a, a few more examples of topics and cultural texts um, that might complement one another. And I have a, I'm going to cough here just a moment. <laughs> okay, um, like all of you probably, um, all of our classrooms are filled with sick students. <laughs> so this is the time <laughs> of the semester where I think we, we really realize exactly how hard we work. Um, so, so comp classes, of course, you could teach the same, the same course every semester and everything would still probably be fine. But one of the things that is really nice about composition classes is that they really can be nimble enough to build on topics that are in the news, um, that are of interest to your campus, that are of interest to your students. And so when you're drawing uh, cultural texts that are kind of ripped from the headlines or ripped from your students' um, immediate world, I think that really does help students see that this is, that what we're talking about is of use, this, that this is not an English class, um, but rather it's a, it's a course for their whole lives. So you might draw on cultural, uh, current cu cultural artifacts. Um, to enhance the text that your students are already reading, as I've said, um, and texts that are likely to provide scholarly theories and framing for considering some of the social justice issues that are in the news right now. So let's look at that column here, uh, structural inequality issues. So writers uh, that you might be assigning in your class, writers like Jonathan Kozal, Peggy McIntosh, Augustin Fuentes, Jean Kilborn, those kinds of folks who are looking at structural inequalities, um, framing theories about race, 
gender, identity, power, many of us teach those kinds of, uh, those kinds of texts that have rich um, critical and theoretical frameworks for analyzing, um, you know, this is just a short list maybe to get us started thinking about some possibilities, but hashtag campaigns, the Black Lives Matter, the Say Her Name campaign, uh, to think about, um, you know, the way conversations about race are unfolding right now, race and gender. The Hollaback campaign, um, interesting for students to consider gender, sexuality, identity, uh, public and private. Uh, BuzzFeed uh, videos or infographics are, you know, these are kind of scrolling across our students' Uh, social media for, um, screens, and those can be very, very rich texts for bringing into class, either inviting students to do that or, in, or doing that yourself. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, strength and, and possible shortfalls of both of those approaches. So you could also maybe focus uh, not so much on the national conversation, but on campus conversations. So, um, for example, every campus is focusing right now, and quite rightly, I would say, on Title IX issues um, and all of the related uh, poster campaigns, educational campaigns, training that go along with them. Those are absolutely exercises in rhetoric and persuasion. They build on themes of power, sexuality, gender roles uh, that often are coming up in your uh, in your course readings anyway. Um, around Title IX, students feel really invested uh, and often very defensive about some of those campaigns. So, you know, why not unpack them in your classroom, all of those cultural artifacts associated with those campaigns, either from the national, the state, or your campus specific level. Um, there are exercises in ethos, pathos, logos, framing, use of data, qualitative, quantitative data. So if you want some examples of those, you can um, do, a, do a search for the White House's It's On Us videos. Uh, they're proliferating. They're very, very interesting um, to consider, and they're very brief, so they're quite useful to use in class or as exercises for homework. So you could assign these, uh, the kind of text that I'm looking at here, and for Title IX, I've listed here a couple hashtag campaigns, the It's On Us campaign, the Step It Up campaign, uh, but again, I'm sure if you walk outside your office door, you will see a poster, or you probably should see a poster uh, about Title IX, um, and if students are looking at them, we want to be inviting them to use their, the skills that they're honing with you um, to talk about those things. Um, so, okay, let's, um, I guess I'm going to pause here and see if there's any um, feedback questions or um, immediate suggestions that people have related to any of these issues. Um, and if not, we can go on to the next section, but let's, um, maybe I'll leave this up and give people just a minute and I'll take a drink of water. Okay. All right. Well, let's um, let's go ahead and look at this next section, which is going to focus on things that you can do in your classes, so things that you can immediately do to introduce some of these strategies. And as we did in the first section, I'm going to start with definitions, HIPS, High Impact Practices, FTW for the win, um, because of course people in composition have been doing high impact practices forever, and it seems as though everyone else is just catching on. So um, be sure that you remind your administrators that you have been doing this work, and that this is what we do in composition classrooms. So this is a very busy slide, um, but probably you have uh, seen and read about these. Uh, this is George Q um, is the person who is probably most often cited for thinking about high impact practices as purposeful learning experiences that deepen student learning and engagement, raise levels of performance, retention, and success for students, and then invoke intellectually engaging and effective educational practices. So doesn't this describe your composition classroom right now? <laughs> um, so, um, so we know that high impact practices retain students because they engage them. Um, you're working closely with professors or instructors. Uh, they're working closely with their peers. And again, I think this is just sort of, you know, to cheer us on, this hard work that we do, which is so different from lecturing to groups of 100 students. Ours are the classrooms that are connect, going to connect students to the campus to help them feel invested in their education. They've been linked to retention, success, improved graduation 
graduation rates. Um, so keep reminding your administrators that that's why we need to keep the uh, course caps <laughs> as, as low as possible so we can do this good work. Um, so for our purposes today, and I'm going to leave this slide here, um, uh, uh, we're going to uh, think about how cultural artifacts can be especially friendly for high impact practices. Okay, so I can see a question here about infographics, um, the best way to teach infographics. And I think what I might do is, um, I'm gonna write that down and return to that maybe after, um, after we go through all the slides and we'll leave some open, open time there because I think that's a, a great suggestion. And of course, students could design their own infographics. So we'll make sure that we talk about that as well. Um, so thanks, Mary Allen, for that question. So, okay. Um, all right, so we'll give some examples here of uh, these are meant to be just, uh, you know, gestural things that should inspire you that are easily adapted. Some activities to try for in-class cultural critique. Really easy to, ad to adapt, transfer. Hopefully you'll suggest some too. Um, so um, what I'm gonna talk about here is a couple exercises uh, in class for thinking about um, improving students' uh, means of analyzing content, applying theories to examples, so some of those key moves that we make in class and also in, in papers. So for example, if students are working on a text similar to Naomi's, Naomi Klein's piece on advertising and branding culture, and again, there may be many different kinds of uh, readings that you're doing that take this on, students could use advertisements to make sure that they understand the content of the argument um, uh, or to practice applying the author's argument to the ads. So um, in this example, this would be a way of understanding branding, the marketing of cultural norms, aspirations. You might be drawing frameworks and theories from uh, texts that you have already read, bring those to bear, layer those on to, um, to what you're asking students to do with advertising. You might ask students to, um, you know, to analyze generic versions of the same commodities that they're looking at, for example, uh, as well. So in class, Students could work on these questions of content or applying theory to, um, to test cases or samples. Um, they might do that in small groups or in pairs. They could uh, report back to the larger class. They could report to another group that has a particular listening task. So this would be, this would count as a high impact practice, putting students in the position of knowledge makers, uh, trying out their skills, flexing their muscles, uh, teaching their peers. So you can put the student audience in the position of continuing to build out the knowledge, not just sort of sitting there because it's not their turn, um, but being responsible for, for example, uh, pointing to one more passage from the reading that would build on what the presenters uh, have already said. Or they might be responsible for um, pulling out another aspect of the visual argument um, that they could comment on. So the idea is to get students actively practicing work on content and rhetoric. Um, they could, of course, also redesign the ad. Um, you know, how would Augustine Fuentes redesign this ad or uh, considering who is the audience and if the audience were a different kind of audience, what would the visual look like? What would the language look like in terms of register? Um, you can do lots of different kinds of visual analysis, thinking about font, color, image, all of those things that are really about producing norms and persuasion. So if you're interested in um, short video texts that model analysis and provide opportunities for students to critique the marketing of norms, I really recommend Sarah Haskins' short YouTubes. Um, so that's Sarah Haskins, her last name is H-A-S-K-I-N-S. -S. Um, she has a series called Target Women that you can uh, search on YouTube. And she's got these beautiful little tiny and very, very funny, so they're especially nice to breathe some life into a classroom that might be a little deflated at this point in the semester. Um, she uses humor and insight and examples to analyze ad campaigns, uh, visual um, ad campaigns, often video or television ads, for yogurt, for chocolate, for cleaning supplies, for jewelry. These are advertisements that your students likely will have seen already. And she looks at them for gender norming, race, class. Um, she makes analysis 
seem awfully fun, and uh, she does stand-up stand comedy. So um, I think that also reminds students that critique is about pleasure, discovery. Um, that's something that students often need to be reminded of rather than tearing something apart, tearing it down. We're opening things up, looking for meaning. Um, so Sarah Haskins is just really useful for thinking about power, gender, sexuality, class, race. Um, uh, from and uh, I think connects well probably to a lot of different kinds of course materials that you might already be working with. So I'm going to provide a few more examples here, um, other cultural texts to try out. So this is a, a short list of cultural texts to get you thinking or help you remember maybe some of um, some kinds of cultural texts that you've used before that, again, at the end of our time, we can maybe, um, you know, chime in with one another what's really worked in your class before. Um, so things that you might try are film trailers, and in particular, um, misrepresentation of the mask you live in are really, really effective for thinking about gender and race. Um, there's a, a wonderful documentary and series of documentaries called Cracking the Codes, uh, which is very effective for thinking about race. TED Talks and documentaries, and particularly some of these um, uh, very short TED Talks, um, you know, three minute, five minute, seven minute versions are quite useful. Uh, video games, um, or even just the sort of marketing of video games, the, the cover slide on video games. Campus marketing materials, so getting students to think critically about the sales job that your own campus is doing. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a writing assignment a little later on. Um, BuzzFeed and infographics we talked about, and again, I'll we'll go back to thinking about um, teaching infographics, and you probably all have some ideas about that as well to share. Catalogs, uh, magazine covers, any, um, anything that's going to provide some rich text and, you know, uh, especially potentially visual and written text together. Um, so uh, film trailers really are um, very handy tools. They're so tiny, uh, they make really tight visual and narrative arguments that are really useful for talking about all different kinds of rhetorical approach and theme. They're really easy to rewatch with reframing in mind. So for example, you might show a, um, a trailer for misrepresentation, uh, which is about um, constructions of femininity and power and political agency, and ask students to watch it looking for or, you know, X's theory of Y, so one, one person you've read, one author's theory of something, uh, and then to rewatch it again for somebody else's theory of something else. Uh, and then you might watch it a third time to look just for methods of persuasion, ethos, pathos, logos. Um, so films or trailers can offer, com can foster conversation on ways that narratives make arguments, which students don't often think about, so the way stories and the way they unfold are acts of norming, persuasion. They do that by assigning value and voice to characters, silencing or giving voice to perspectives, resolving issues or not. Um, so even though this isn't a literature course or a film studies course, thinking of filmic texts as, as, way, as uh, places where arguments are made, very influential arguments is, um, I think, exactly what we do in a composition classroom. Um, probably many of you are familiar with the Bechdel test uh, for discussing gender, power, and sexism on the screen. So Alison Bechdel is a, a graphic uh, artist who came up with this very simple rubric for testing sexism in films. Um, you know, are there at least two women who talk to one another about something besides a man. <laughs> uh, most, most texts fail that test. Um, so anyway, analyzing trailers is a really flexible and fun way to give students in-class practice, applying theories to examples, testing the limits of an argument, making connections, etc. cetera. Um, so you can also uh, get students to um, get pretty engaged by showing trailers from some of their fav favorite um, Disney or Pixar films, reframing them from what they think they understood that film was about. Um, we have a, a reading in our book by Ken Gillum and Shannon Wooden about constructions of masculinity in pex Pixar films, and that has, um, uh, I get a lot of bang for my buck <laughs> when I teach that. Um, there's a lot of really interesting, of course, sustainability films, um, and the, even just the, the trailer for the documentary Food Patriots is full of materials for discussing sustainability, food justice, power, urban politics. Um, so you might take a look just at that, uh, the trailer for Food Patriots and see, um, you know, 
see if that sparks something for your class. Um, and you may all have um, some nice additional suggestions as well. So I have one more slide in this section, and then we'll pause maybe and see if um, you all would like to chime in with some texts that have worked for you. And this is thinking about the activities that you do in class as strategically moving students toward your writing assignments. So in-class preparation for writing assignments. Um, so um, well, I'll just take a look at what's here. So um, you can uh, use, these are some in-class ways to locate connections between texts. So as an example here, you could ask students uh, to connect Sherry Turkle's concept of the tethered self. So she has a very grim vision of screen life and how it is um, destroying us. <laughs> uh, to Jane McGonigal, who's a, a game designer, you may have heard her in the news lately. She has a, a um, video game that she designed uh, called Super Better that is for people, um, designed for people to recover from PTSD and brain trauma, uh, which came out of her own experience of brain trauma. So she has a much more optimistic view of, um, of the potential of screen culture and play and video game play. Um, and you can ask, um, you know, students to work in pairs or groups on textual connections, uh, pairs or groups to applying examples beyond class. So um, video games, um, other kinds of screen culture examples that you could bring in to ask people um, uh, to talk about some of these um, some of these things. I can see people are asking some questions here, so that's great. I'll stop at the end of this slide here. So, um, so here's a, just another example, a content example. Um, applying insights from text on advertising and media to other themes, such as education, so taking something from one context, applying it in another. Uh, many of us teach Mark Edmondson's critique about education as light entertainment, and you might teach other, um, uh, you know, Richard Rodriguez or some of these other classic texts that invite students to think critically about what it is that we're doing in education, what it is, what, what school does for uh, to us uh, is really the theme on some of those. Um, and you could ask students to apply those frameworks to thinking about your campuses, print or video marketing. Um, it's very amusing often to sort of see um, what it is that schools are selling. It looks like nobody's ever in class. People are always sitting under trees in lively conversation in perpetual beautiful autumn. <laughs> so um, students could actually then, of course, design alternative materials that they think are true or that actually uh, speak to what it is that the um, that, you know, what happens in the, in the life of your university. They could offer that to your um, campus marketing folks. That would be a nice kind of activism. Um, so, okay, so let's pause here uh, to um, see some suggestions, uh, questions and suggestions. So, best way to teach infographics. Um, so those, of course, can look like a million different things. So I'll offer some suggestions here. And Stuart, I don't know if you wanna, um, uh, type in a suggestion or um, or if other folks want to chime in here it's a it's a great question so visual rhetoric I think any any of the things that you do with an advertisement you can do with infographics thinking about occasion audience um, uh, persuasive tactics ethos pathos logos infographics often do really interesting things with um, quantitative data, less so with qualitative data, but I think inviting students to think about um, what would happen if um, this information were presented as a pie chart rather than a graph, for example, or, um, you know, do you actually understand the X and Y gra uh, axes of this graph? If not, what does it assume about the way we read things? Um, you can talk about uh, language choices, pitch, rhetoric, formality, informality. Um, you could have students, of course, design some, um, design their alternative materials, and there are some really wonderful, there's great software out there right now for um, that make it very easy for students to design infographics. Um, so that's a sort of quick response. I think if you treat them like advertisements in some way, you can use all of the same kind of um, uh, the same tool chest. So um, so should I read these 
questions here. There's there's one from Rachel Block. I'll just read this aloud in case it's not showing up on people's screens because I think this is a a good general question for us to think about as we think about both writing assignments and also the 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 larger question of what it is that we do when we teach this kind of content in a composition class. So Rachel has asked, um, do you have effective strategies for students who offer resistance? I like the word offer there. <laughs> offer resistance to some of the cultural critiques, especially when students are members of the discourse communities being critiqued. Um, so this is, you know, a, an excellent question and, and really the elephant in the room, which is, you know, do you want to potentially make your life more difficult by teaching hot button topics? And of course, um, it's quite possible to talk about pop culture or to bring these kinds of texts in without touching on um, topics that might be unsettling and that might be uncomfortable with students. Um, but I also think, again, like the composition classroom is the place where students get the skills. It's the place where you actually have the room, the opportunity, the occasion to ask people to think about how do we talk about these topics? Why is it so difficult? Why is it that these feel so emotionally charged? What language do we use? Who gets to talk about these topics? Um, so if I, um, and, you know, I, I, I bring race, I, I'm sure many of us do bring, you know, structural inequality, race, class, gender into our classrooms all the time. And I think um, giving, drawing on the readings that you're using that often help students see that um, something like white privilege isn't simply a matter of being a kind or a mean person, you know, structural inequality is, is, is the way the world is organized right now. Um, and so helping students, I guess, um, using the composition classroom as a way to invite students to think about, you know, how would, how does the information, for example, that we're getting in Augustine Fuentes' analysis of race as a social construction or, you know, fill in the blank, whoever you're, you're reading, what would he say about the Black Lives Matter campaign? Or if he were sitting in the room right, right here, um, what could he or she, you know, Peggy McIntosh, um, what would she say about the tone that our conversation has taken? Um, what would she notice? What can we notice using her skills about who's talking, who's not? Um, so I think, you know, you have to have a, a certain comfort level with discomfort in a, in a composition classroom. But I think as often as we can, simply opening it up and saying, so what's going on here? What does this feel like? Let's take the temperature of the room. Let's hit pause in this discussion and notice at a rhetorical level what's happening. How are we framing our discussion? That those can be, um, those can be really powerful moments for students to think about how it is that we talk about these issues. And yours, again, may be the only class where students do that. Um, otherwise, students are sort of barreling through the content in a sociology class, you know, getting ready for the exam, um, for example. So, um, certainly students resist. Um, and I guess, um, I guess one final thought I have there, and we'll see if other folks want to chime in or, or wait until the end, is to always just, you can always steer students back to the text. Um, so to make it clear, this is, um, you know, we're practitioners here, we're learning to talk about these ideas, we're learning to, to talk about really difficult ideas with some new tools. Let's go back into the text and think about, um, uh, you know, what are some passages, what are some theories, what are some ideas that, um, that could help us frame those, uh, frame what it is that's happening right now. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a, a start of a much bigger conversation that I hope people are having with your, with your peers as well on your campus about what conversations are coming up and what are effective tactics. Um, and I guess I'll just pause here and see if, um, Steve or Jillian, if if there are questions that I'm not seeing here or comments that we should take a look at before moving to the final section and then just opening it wide up. Uh, Rachel Bucks uh, would like to add, I love that you said we need to have a certain amount of comfort, comfort <laughs> in the composition classroom. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, of course, this is a matter of performance and practice and ethos, and of course, it hugely matters who we are, how old we are, what we look like when we when we walk into the classroom. Um, it's it's hard, um, you know. But again, 
this is this is the place to have people practice talking about these things and depersonalizing them. So, um, other folks want to chime in there? I don't see any other questions, April. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, April, just a time check for you. Um, this is Joy. Okay. Let's move along. Minutes. Okay. All right. All right. So, You're doing great. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. So we're going to look. I have just a few more slides here, and then we'll open it wide up to thinking about writing assignments that you'll want students to do uh, based on engaging with these cultural texts. So there's lots and lots of possibilities. I have just a few more slides, um, and then we'll open this up. Um, and, you know, this is the time of year when a lot of students are flagging, when we're flagging, so it would be great if people chime in with, um, you know, successful things, fail-safe uh, cultural texts that you use to inject some life into your classrooms and particularly joy. <laughs> we, we could all use a little joy uh, in our classrooms at this point in the semester. Um, so, um, adapting your program's learning outcomes to these, you know, I, I can't presume to know what your particular program's writing objectives are uh, or those goals, but drawing on cultural text can help students apply big ideas in your course to these relevant texts beyond your course. Um, so just some quick ideas here on um, non-research writing assignments that you might be doing particularly early in the semester where students apply concepts uh, from a text or perhaps two texts to a cultural example um, that you supply. So for example, advertising images, a film text, or maybe just a scene or a slice of a film text. Um, so that gives you a sort of uh, the benefit of doing a writing sign, uh, crafting a writing assignment like that is that you can ensure really rich materials that have promising connections to all the reading. So you've got some um, control over the text that folks are going to be working with. So the shortfall of that, of course, is that students are not seeking and finding their own text. So it's less of a high impact practice. Um, they might not be as engaged in the um, in the examples that you offer. Um, so that's a, a shortfall there, but, but this kind of controlled environment is good for weaker students, it's good for lower level writing students, it's good for earlier in the semester when um, you don't want to risk, um, you know, giving students the freedom perhaps to, to make bad choices, <laughs> to make choices on working with texts that are not going to be as rich. Um, and then I've just got this sort of reminder here that as always when we think about cultural tr critique, um, of course, you can write about anything, but we want to, you know, should we? You want to make sure that students are writing about um, text and drawing conclusions that are actually matter. So these are questions that probably we all teach, but just as a reminder um, to invite students to think about what's going to happen if this issue that they're writing about stays the same, what happens if it changes, what's at stake and for whom, if things stay the same or if they change, what's the significance that you see in your findings. So this is the Henry Giroux question, I guess. You know, um, sure, you can talk about Disney, but should we? Um, he says yes. Lots of people say yes. Um, but we want to think about why. What are these texts going to teach us? Um, so this is really the same slide, thinking about writing assignments with research. Um, so this is where students apply concepts from a text or two texts to a cultural example that they supply. Um, so the benefit of that would be that students have to take responsibility for finding cultural texts that they really want to work with. Uh, you can see if they're really gathering, um, you know, understanding what it is to discover, uh, to select a, an archive that they want to work with, a series of advertisements, for example, or two films. Um, you know, the risk is also that the students won't find material that's rich enough, and so this requires a lot more scaffolding, probably proposals, pre-checks, drafts. Uh, it's good for stronger students and for higher level writing courses uh, and also for later in the semester. Um, so finally here, I've got two slides that just sort of walk through uh, a sample a, a sequence of assignments, which probably lots of you do, um, but what I mean by sequencing is assignments, writing assignments that build on the previous one that ask students to return to um, earlier readings, to their own earlier writing, to reframe, to break open their ideas with um, additional tools. 
um, which is, of course, the key move that we make as intellectuals. So in this slide, here's the first two of uh, four um, sequence writing assignments that, that we've designed that's in our book that's a great model for other kinds of, um, I mean, you can just see how this works. So this is a series of writing assignments based on the question, what do media representations tell us about U.S. education? So interesting question. So the first writing assignment, um, you might, you know, call something like educated by the movies, asking students to apply course texts on education, so readings that they've already done that help students theorize about the work of education. Uh, critiques of education to uh, a film that is explicitly, or a series of films or scenes from films that are explicitly about education. So we've got a, a list here, um, and students might have many more in mind, but these are ones that students have written about with great success. Um, so Stand and Deliver, Dangerous Minds, Dead Poets Society, Freedom Writers, School of Rock, people love to write about the Harry Potter films, Charlie Bartlett. Um, so a second assignment in that series might be, okay, now that you've done that, uh, return to these ideas perhaps with, um, you know, a text that focuses on race, gender, class, or other kinds of uh, identity markers, and think about how those films inform the text. So returning to a film text with ideas from a fresh reading. Uh, and then these are the, the third and fourth um, in, the, in an assignment, so of course, or, or in this, um, in this sequence, but of course you could just have a pair of assignments as a sequence, or you could shape an entire semester built on this kind of approach. So a third writing assignment might be building on those first two assignments, the writing that students did, um, adding scholarly research from the library to extend, reconsider, see new significance in the film and your findings. You could provide an, an additional cultural text for students to work with. Um, a fourth assignment might be bringing your insights from the previous writing assignments to bear on your campus's promotional videos, website, brochure. So again, this idea of helping students look at the marketing that's already all around them and that they are essentially implicated in as, as uh, you know, members of, of that campus. Um, so again, you could, you know, invite students to create a PSA, um, to create some marketing materials uh, for the promotion, your campus promotional department as well. So, I mean, I guess ultimately, and I'll, I'll stop here on the next slide, is that we're, we should be asking ourselves what we want students to do with the knowledge from our courses. And, you know, I hope the answer for all of us is we want them to act on it, to have some kind of activism. And that could look a lot of different ways. We might want them to act differently as thinkers, as teachers of their peers, as consumers, as voters as active bystanders who might intervene or improve a conversation based on assumptions or ignorance. Uh, so in our classes, the students are really learning how to think, and we want to make sure that we're introducing them to, ca to challenging new discourses of the academy, of course, that they're going to be working on uh, their whole college career in, um, in their other disciplines, but we also want them to be flexing those skills beyond our classrooms and beyond the campus. So including these kinds of cultural texts in your class gives them that practice that they can continue to perfect, you know, hopefully forever, right, you know, to infinity and beyond. <laughs> um, so cultural texts that are relevant and drawn from immediate cultural conversations and, um, you know, hopefully at some point in the semester supplied by them empowers them and it should show them that analysis is fun, uh, hopefully as well. Um, so this is, um, uh, just a quick rundown of what uh, we have to offer in our book, the, in its third edition from Inquiry to Academic Writing uh, with Stuart Green um, that builds on the kinds of things that we were talking about here, a full rhetoric um, with rhetorical guides, a uh, reader that's both disciplinary and thematic um, uh, that, you can, that you can adjust to lots of different kinds of courses, uh, and also first semester and second semester writing courses. Uh, we offer e-texts and interactive texts, these kind of cultural texts in every, uh, in every chapter, so really we provide those materials for students to work with, as well as in-class exercises and writing assignments that are built on the kind of model that I've talked about here. Um, okay, so here I think we're going to rest on this slide and see if there are um, other questions or if Stuart would like to weigh in on this question of reading infographics or resistance to some of these ideas. Um, I, I recall a, a student who said to me once, um, 
are you trying to change me? <laughs> and I thought, what an excellent question. And of course the answer is yes, <laughs> or else what the heck are you doing here? So, um, but of course it's the knowledge that should change folks. So I'm going to pause here and see if Stuart would like to chime in or if there's other uh, questions or comments. Great, so Jillian, we could, if we could unmute Stuart. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Stuart says, uh, no, that's okay. I appreciate April's <laughs> explanation. Uh, <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, and I don't know if um, Rachel Buck, since she asked that great question, has, has anything that she would like to suggest about either what's, what's happened. I mean, we can also talk about challenges that people are facing. We have just a few minutes here. Or I would love to hear from folks if you've got films um, that have worked. Um, Okay, so here's a, a great question. Um, some students take a long time to become informed about issues that are supposed to be current and immediate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, they do. Okay, what's a good way to give them a primer without yourself forcing a narrative on a particular social issue? Okay, great question there, um, alas. So, um, of course, one of the things that you could do is assign students um, for homework to do something like, you know, read Google News before you come to class, come uh, read some kind of news aggregate um, and see what you find. You could make that a, a, um, an ongoing assignment in your class to follow a particular issue. Really interesting and easy to do and these, um, now that we're already in the campaign season. Um, so um, it's interesting, I've often had students uh, if we're talking about a contemporary topic or a political topic to compare um, the coverage of it in a news aggregate, uh, like in three different news aggregates, so try Google News, The Guardian, um, and Al Jazeera, and see how the same kind of theme is coming up. Um, often you can do a really interesting rhetorical analysis just of the Google News page. I often do that and see like how many, I'm often doing this in gender studies classes, but thinking about, you know, how many women are pictured? Um, what counts as news in these news aggregates? Um, how can we relate that to what we're reading in Sherry Turkle about screen culture or any of the readings that you're, that you're talking about? Um, but yes, it is true that some students take a long time to become <laughs> informed about issues. Um, so I guess, um, yes, well, you want to make sure that you're not the one providing them with all the news to send them out um, to, to see where people find that. So Stuart says, I like the idea of infographics uh, and both instructors and students might look at Charles Blow's writing in the New York Times. Yeah, excellent. So there's a lot of, uh, Charles Blow has written some really wonderful pieces about um, race, looking at um, and gender and sexuality, so is Frank Bruni, um, Roxanne Gay, um, Roxanne with one N, uh, has been writing some really interesting pieces about uh, Black Lives Matter and Say Her Name, so, um, so Stuart says, I often ask students to write research arguments and then compose an infographic to represent the argument to an audience that might read the Times. Um, so very cool. And I, Stuart, do you know the name of some, um, I had written down somewhere, and now I've left that on another desk. There is a, 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 a particular software that I think is very, very student friendly, and I don't know if you have a name for that. I'm sure it's Googleable. Um, but the infographic is a really nice compact form and a way to get students to practice visual rhetoric um, and it's fun and interesting. It's something they can do in class or as a, as a brief homework or something to accompany, as Stuart is saying here, a researched argument. Anybody else want to toss out some things that work particularly well in your classes? Uh, Candace Floyd says, sometimes I have a current events dialogue class and tell them ahead of time to view or read news. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, so you have to be kind of ahead of the game there, but then that way, um, that's wonderful. Then you can seed the dialogue. And of course, you could use your course management platforms to, to set up a forum for people to start weighing in before class, or um, you could have, assign a, a particular small group to be responsible for supplying some links um, to establish news sources and maybe a variety of news sources before class to have them responsible for pulling them up on the screen in class if you've got a big screen and talk people through the 
rhetorical modes or strategies and skills that you're that you're teaching or links to um, you know use that as a jumping off point for the rest of the class to develop links to readings so that's really nice good idea there other folks are there ways of using social media? I mean, certainly BuzzFeed is doing an awfully nice job of providing um, very tight little text that we can often use. And again, that often inject life into, you know, if it's hitting minute 45 in your class and, and people are, the, you know, the, the energy is low, returning people to a text or those um, Sarah Haskins videos are just absolutely fail safe, they always um, kind of liven things up and you've got a fresh text to give people a chance to practice applying theories to the fresh text that they've all just seen. Any other suggestions that people have or challenges? I mean, I guess I'll also just kind of put a little pitch in here that this will make teaching more fun for you. I think lots of us probably can go on automatic pilot very, uh, fairly effectively, um, but introducing even these small texts or having them kind of in your back pocket for a low energy day um, makes things more interesting. You're, you're uh, you know, likely to discover things that you hadn't really thought about as well. And so I think students, when you're working with these very fresh texts, students have the opportunity um, to do what Jose Bowen calls slow thinking, which I really like, this idea that um, students don't see very many models of people actually thinking through an issue. That's another high impact practice, something that you can do, that you can model with students in your classroom in real time, watching something, re-watching it, returning to it, asking questions. Um, hearing their responses, modeling a kind of slow think, think, thinking where you feel comfortable saying, oh, I, I hadn't really thought about that. You know, let me think about that some more. What do other people think? Let's think about what Peggy McIntosh could say. Um, that model of slow thinking, again, is a level of meta-analysis that students rarely get in other classes that are galloping through content. Um, so. Anyone else want to share some good strategies? Okay, so here's a, a comment here. Um, I sometimes, uh, from Alakam um, Amatya, I probably didn't do too well with that name. So um, I, uh, I sometimes ask each student to bring a link to a new story to class and talk about it for a minute. Any suggestions about adjusting the level of difficulty for such an assignment so that it doesn't consume too much of their time? So that's great. So it looks like lots of you are on the same page here. Um, uh, so one, props on the assignment. Suggestions for adjusting the level of difficulty for such an assignment. So interesting. Um, I think it, it might depend on what you're asking them to do with it. Uh, so you could ask them to do one very particular small task with a news uh, story like that, thinking just about ethos, just about pathos, just about logos. Um, you could, you know, narrow the focus a lot to think uh, simply about examples or framing, issues of authority, um, whether people use qualitative or quantitative analysis, um, the extent to which you can think about audience so that students are not responsible for covering everything, but maybe just really focusing on um, one particular aspect of that text. And um, Stuart, I don't know if you have some ideas about that, but I think um, uh, that, is, that is, of course, you're pointing to a real risk, which is when you introduce these color, uh, uh, additional sorts of text in your class, um, it, it can take up time. So you've got to really think about, you know, what is the end game here? What do you want students to walk away with at the end of your 55 minutes or 75 minutes or however long your course is? And so I think that's a, you know, a kind of seat of the pants teaching that we got to be thinking about. Um, students can often, uh, you could ask them to teach these to one another and have groups report back or pairs report back. So that can also make time a little bit more efficient as well. Um, but these are, these are great suggestions here. Other voices? All right. 
Should we go to the final slide here, or um, sure. did you want to talk a little bit about, whoops, sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, okay, let's see. No worries, April. Um, I'll talk as you're, <laughs> as you're finding it. Uh, so this is Joy again. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your thoughtful questions and comments for April. Uh, the slide you're seeing on the screen now is just a little reminder, uh, and, and most of you, I think, logged into the webinar through our English community, but there's some great resources there. We want to just point you to those. Uh, so the English community is a place where you can share and swap assignments, as you can see. All of our professional resources that you sort of get those small booklets that Bedford typically provides to schools for faculty training, those are downloadable on the website. Uh, there's a great opportunity to network with your colleagues and your authors as you're all doing now. Uh, we've got more webinars planned in this series, so you can check them out on the events calendar. And we have a, a new uh, feature called the Reviewer's Corner, and you can log in there and become a reviewer of our products. So uh, I appreciate April giving me the time to make a plug there. And we can go to the final slide where um, both April and Stuart have provided their contact information. So uh, April, the, the final thought is yours. Okay, well, I think that's, um, that's all I have, except that I hope that um, you all will stay in touch. It would be uh, great to hear from you. You've got our email there about things that are working for you, or, or if you have, um, uh, you know, if you've got speaking points in class. I think uh, using these kinds of texts, you know, is, um, injects fun, but of course, it does inject a, a certain amount of risk into classrooms, and I, I appreciate that people have brought that up. Um, but I also think, again, ours is a classroom where that should happen. And, you know, if you're not working a little bit with risk, probably we're, um, we're underperforming, I would say. So I hope that um, people feel, uh, you know, feel brave and optimistic about using these kinds of texts. And um, it would be great, excuse me, to hear from you all on texts that work really well for you, and I appreciate the ideas uh, that you all have added, and I wish you luck with the rest of the semester. Um, you know, stay hydrated and eat a lot of protein. <laughs> uh, the semester is a long one, and this is, uh, um, this is right when we need to remind ourselves of just how crucial this work is, um, probably the most important course that anybody takes, and that is why probably all of you are writing so many letters of recommendation <laughs> uh, for students right now at this time of the semester because students get to know us um, and return to us, and that has um, that is a great compliment. So thanks very much, all of you, for listening in and chiming in, and it would be great to hear from you. Wonderful, and thank you so much, April, for the time you put into preparing the webinar and presenting it today. Uh, we will send out a link to the recording after uh, the call. We just have to download it, so look for it in the next 24 hours. Uh, you can share that with your colleagues. Uh, we'll make it available on the community site as well. And as April said, you can reach out to her or to Stuart uh, with their email addresses provided here. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great evening or a great day if you're on the West Coast. Appreciate All right, your time. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, April. Bye-bye. Hey, <laughs> Thank you, Steve and Jillian. Thank you. Thank you.